BC. Plus or minus several hundred, maybe 500 or so allowances for genealogy um, overlapping and things like that. If the, we're, we're going to use the word 4,000, but don't hold me to that, okay? I'm not one of those guys that says Adam was created 4,004 BC, October 23rd at 2 in the afternoon, okay? I, knew, I do know Adam was created in the afternoon because it was just before Eve. That's the only clue we have in Scripture. But it doesn't give the exact date. All right, so we're going to, about 4,000 years ago. Then the Bible says, 1,600 years later, there was a worldwide flood, a flood that destroyed the world. This took place about... 1,600 years after the creation. Actually, 1656, if the date's given are exactly correct. After this flood, there were only eight survivors, eight people on board that ark. Those eight people began producing a population. They had lived, they lived longer, so they had more children, maybe 10 or 15 kids per family. Population began to grow pretty rapidly. And by the time you got to the year zero, the time of Jesus Christ, the world population, and anybody would agree with this that studied the population statistics of the world, the world population was approximately one-fourth of a billion. One quarter billion, 250 million, is the approximate world population at the time of Christ. You can go upstairs to your library to the next building over here and get the uh, population statistics, uh, Macmillan Encyclopedia, or look it up in any one you want that deals with the population issue. Most experts agree the whole world population 2,000 years ago was approximately a quarter billion. 250 million. Then the population began to grow, especially around the 1600s when a lot of new uh, medical advancements came on the scene and a lot of really, really modern science began about the 1600s. That's where there was a great, of course, revival in reading the Bible. The King James Version was translated and many versions were put into the English language or into the common people's language where people could read it for themselves. And I think that was one of the great causes of the great revival of interest in learning and knowledge. And along with that came some tremendous medical advancements and scientific advancements and technology advancements. And so people began living longer, producing more children, and children lived longer. And the, about 1600 is when the population began to skyrocket. 1800, there were one billion people in the world. In 1800, we crossed the one billion mark. In 1930, it crossed the two billion mark. 1930. Today it's up over five billion. But really all of the population growth has come in the last couple of hundred years. So it is very possible that the whole world's population started 4,400 years ago with eight people. Anybody familiar with population growth rates, logarithmic extrapolation could tell you, yes, the whole world's population, six billion, could have easily started only four or 5,000 years ago. Now the evolutionist interpretation of, it's a fact, we have about, I'm gonna say five and a half billion people in the world. We'll put that in the fact column. Nobody argues with that. I mean, that's not an exact number, but it's close enough. Well, how do you interpret that? The evolutionist says the population stayed at 50,000 or so for many, many, many thousands of years, several million years. There were just a few thousand people in the world, or subhumans. And then they would agree from about the time, about 1,000 BC on, they would agree with the population growth curve that the creationist would give to it. These are established facts. But the evolutionist has this line going along at 30 or 40, 50,000 for 3 million years. And populations simply don't grow like that. They're just an automatic blast off, just like putting money in the bank. Once you reach a certain number of dollars in the bank, the compounded interest starts to take over. So the creationist interpretation is no problem. The fact that we have five and a half billion really fits fine into the biblical chronology of starting 4,400 years ago with eight people getting off an <coughs> ark. The evolutionist would also say no problem, but he would have to say that this population was steady for millions of years. So if you look at the facts, neither one it can be discounted based on the fact that we have a population. If you're willing to admit a worldwide flood in Noah's day, then the formation of Grand Canyon and Carlsbad Caverns and the Snake River Valley and all those canyon formations are really no problem for the creationist. Somebody, if a teacher says, well, millions of years ago, the first question ought to come into your mind is, uh, excuse me, were you there? You know, do you know it's millions or billions of years old? Time is something, I mean, it's gone, okay? It's historical. We can't really have scientific data. We must have historical data. And it becomes a very different way to interpret it. I believe when God created the heavens and the earth, everything, about six or 7,000 years ago, everything was very perfect. Perfect world, completely done. Poof, he spoke and it was done in six literal 24-hour days. And during that time, everything lived together, including the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs lived with man. They were just big, friendly lizards in the Garden of Eden. See, the unusual thing about lizards, if you've had your biology classes, you know that lizards and many reptiles never stop growing. They never stop. 
When I moved into my house across the street from Pensacola Christian High School two years ago, I was going around meeting all my neighbors, knocking on doors, finding out who the neighbors were, and like everybody ought to do in the neighborhood, be friendly, you know. And I knocked on this house six doors down from my house, and the guy said, come on in. Well, I walked in, and there, crawling around loose on his kitchen floor right in front of me was a five-foot-long iguana. This guy raises iguanas for pet stores, five foot long. I stopped, held perfectly still. I said, does it bite? He said, no, no, we just fed it. I said, how big is that thing going to get? He said, it's an iguana, man. They never stop growing. He said, I've raised them 10 feet long before. Lizards never stop growing. So the creationist would say, dinosaurs lived in the pre-flood era for about 1,600 years. They were just simply giant lizards. The Bible teaches, and of course it's not scientifically provable because it's gone now, the Bible teaches that the original earth, when God first made it, had a canopy of water above the atmosphere. The air that we're breathing today has about six layers to it, troposphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, exosphere, ionosphere. There used to be a seventh layer, according to scripture. The seventh layer was a layer of water above the atmosphere, made some kind of cloud cover. Venus has a dense cloud cover, Jupiter has a dense cloud cover. The earth apparently had a dense, I don't know about dense, but had some kind of water above the atmosphere which would do several things. It would filter out the <coughs> harmful effects of the sun. Most of the aging process is caused by the sun, especially ultraviolet light and uh, x-rays that are destroying your body, and your body has to constantly battle against those damaging effects of the sunlight. The original creation did not have that. According to scripture, they were protected by a canopy of water, which many creationists think would have increased air pressure. It's interesting, some of the articles out now about what happened to the dinosaurs. Uh, International Falls, Minnesota, the Daily Journal. New theory, lack of oxygen killed the dinosaurs from the Boston Associated Press. Studies of dinosaurs indicate they had very small lungs compared to their body size. Also, they had very small nostrils. The nostrils of a Brachiosaurus were about the same size as those in a horse. So how's a critter that big, 150 feet now is the world's record, how's he going to get enough oxygen to survive? Well, in today's atmosphere, a 150-foot dinosaur could not survive. He couldn't get enough oxygen to maintain body metabolism. But if the pre-flood scenario is correct, that before the flood there was a canopy of water, this would increase air pressure, meaning every time you take a breath, you get twice the oxygen. Not only that, the pre-flood world apparently had richer oxygen to begin with. They drill into the ancient uh, samples of amber and find air bubbles in there, trapped amber, or amber that traps air bubbles, when you analyze the air bubbles, this is from Time Magazine, 1987, page 82, also Science Magazine, 1987, November, page 890, tells about the sampling of the air found in amber. It indicates 50% more oxygen than we had today. So instead of 20% oxygen, they had 30% oxygen. Well, these are a couple of scientific facts that really would fit fine with the creationist worldview. The original Earth had a little richer oxygen and higher pressure. The strange thing about high pressure gases is when you take a breath, you get twice the oxygen per lungful, and your healing process is much faster. Many major hospitals today are putting in what's called hyperbaric chambers. Little Jessica McClure, the girl in Texas that fell down in the well, remember that, 1987? Her foot was twisted around and stuck in her face as she was down inside of a 12-inch pipe for over two days, 58 and a half hours. When they got her out, her foot was completely black and part of her leg was black from lack of circulation. They were going to cut her foot off, but one of the doctors suggested that they try her in a hyperbaric chamber. They put Jessica in a big steel chamber, pumped it up full of pure oxygen, and put it up to 30 pounds per square inch. Today you're breathing about 14.7 pounds per square inch atmospheric pressure. At 30 pounds per square inch, 